Yeah, good afternoon for everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are very much audible, Doctor. Oh, doctor. Yeah, thank you so much. So, welcome today for sessions is pediatric nephrotic syndromes. Yeah, we're just discussing about the management of pediatric nephrotic syndromes. So we can start. So the learning objectives just with look at definition of the nephrotic syndrome, etymology, etiology in the classifications, clinical presentations, investigations, approach for management and the complication of nephrotic syndromes. The nephrotic syndromes is the commonest coronary renal disease in the children and the most common predominant renal disease seen in nephrology clinic and the initially had the highest mortality around 70% before discovery of the use of antibiotic. And that's before um, 1090, before Fleming discovered penicillins. And as per now, the mortality is just almost around 90% with the use of antibiotic. So the reason for highest mortality initially was infection related with nephrotic syndromes. The nephrotic syndrome is defined as massive proteinuria, which is greater than 40 milligram per meter square per hour, or 1,000 milligram per gram for 24 hours, when you are now using the urine collections. Or either hyperbinemia, uh, albumin less than two gram per deciliter, the presence of edema, and hyperlipidemia. So, or either when you use now the urine creatinine protein, the urine protein creatinine ratio, which is supposed to be greater than two. However, to make the diagnosis, at least you need two. You need now proteinuria, which is range, nephrotic range proteinuria, and you need also hyperbinemia to confirm the diagnosis. So this is the summary definition we may use to know now the nephrotic syndromes. So the first one, so we don't need to repeat, it was already done. So the second is that to call the complete remission. So complete remission is uh, the patient who have been on prednisolone. Then when you do three consecutive urinalysis, there's no protein in the urine or there's a trace for three consecutive three days. So by clinical, you do now the urine protein creatinine ratio less than 200 milligrams per grams or less than 20 milligrams per millimoles or urinary urinalysis when you have now less than one protein in the urine, so for three consecutive days. So partial emissions is when you have now protein reduction of 50% or a greater from the presenting value and absolute urinary urine protein creatinine ratio between 200 and 2,000 milligram per grams. So in our setting, usually for us, we say this partial emissions when the patient at least edema result and you still have proteinuria. So near emissions is fair to reduce urine protein excretion by 50% from baseline or persistence excretion of the urine protein creatinine ratio more than 2,000 milligram per grams or more than 200 milligram per millimoles. So initial responder is attainment of the complete emissions within initial four weeks of corticosteroid therapy. So that's the patient who comes. You start the hardest of prednisolone for the first treatment the patient has remissions. So initial non-responder, uh, what we call now steroid resistance, sorry, is fair to achieve complete remission after eight weeks of the corticosteroid therapies. And the relapse is when you have you now the patient who have been achieved the remissions. That's the, the, the people to understand because not all of one will be able to do unit protein creatinine ratio. Okay. But when you patient come back more than period, more than two weeks, so has now proteinuria three plus in the urine for three consecutive days. So that one is go is diagnosed as the relapse. Infrequent relapse is one relapse, sorry, is one relapse within six months of initial response, or one three relapse within 20 months period for initial treatment. So frequent relapse is two or more relapse within six months, or four or more relapse within 
12 months period. The steroid dependent is for the patient who has two consecutive relapses during corticosteroid therapy or within 14 days of seizing therapy. So to understand, there's a patient you start on prednisolone, you start at the higher dose, two milligram per kilo or 60 milligram per meter square. So the patient is responding well on the treatment. When you taper down, the patient has now relapse of proteinuria, or either the patient has been responding on the way on the treatment until you achieve remission, taper down prednisolones, you complete the treatment within a period of 14 days, the patient has another relapse. So that one is steroid dependent. So then finally, large non responder is persistent proteinuria during four or more weeks of corticosteroid following one or more remission. So what is epidemiology of the chronic, the, the nephrotic syndromes? The prevalence of nephrotic syndrome is estimated to be approximately 16 cases per 100,000 children. The peak age of presentation is almost two years with approximately 70, 60 to 70% cases occurring in children less than six years old. And the most of those children, they're suffering from more minimal change disease. So the annual incidence of nephrotic syndrome range from two to seven new cases per 100,000. And the more prevalent in young male, so once the children are young, the predominance of the male ratio at the two over one, but at around 10 years, the ratio is one to two. So when you consider now the issue concerning now the ethnicities, we realize most of the children who have nephrotic syndrome are from South Asian children, which has high risk five times than other children. So when you compare with the South African, African children has lower, lower incidence of nephrotic syndrome. However, they have a higher risk to develop nowadays focal segmental bromeosclerosis more than other children globally. Those are the study published in either UK or either in the ESA. So let's look about now a etiology of the nephrotic syndromes. So etiology, we can just look about the age at the presentations and we look about what is the most common cause of the nephrotic syndrome. So when you have now the nephrotic syndrome, it appears less than three months old. So the most common cause is just the genetic. So you have now the, the gene NPHC1, so which is nephrin, NPHC2, which is podocyte injuries, we tumor ones, we pro the protein of genetics, LAM2, or the Pearson syndromes. Or either you may have now the secondary causes as infections. In the most of our, our settings, the most common cause is the megalovirus. However, we found some rare cases of the HIV and the hepatitis B, or either maternal lupus. When now you have the children between three years, three months and one year, so they may have also genetic causes, but it's unlikely to have the secondary causes. So the genetic causes are similar for the ones, NPH1, NPH2, women tumor ones, and LAMP2. So or some of them, they may have minimal change nephrotic syndromes, or the other one, they may have idiopathic conditions. So the theology for the children now above one year, so most of them, more than 60%, they present with minimal change nephrotic syndromes. And the other part, focal segmental glomerulosis, which is the most a uh, case of steroid re resistance in our setting. So you must still have you know, the hepatic condition. So you have a mutation in the gene, NPH2, that's the name of the podocyte injury. We have also mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis, where you have IgM nephropathy, C1 key nephropathy, especially for the one with the lupus, mambano proliferative glomerulonephritis and the membranous nephropathies. So those one, we make the diagnosis usually after uh, biopsy and histopathology. So when you look about it now, what is the most common cause diseases which trigger nephrotic syndromes? So we have systemic disease like henoxian nephropola, IG nephropathy, systemic lupus stomatosis, infection with still comes like hepatitis B, C, HIV, 
pyruvious by 19 you have some malignancy especially leukemia and lymphoma when it is lymphoma just most of the chronic disease also you may have now the medication toxin so we have now said that inflammatory drugs penicillamine carbotoprin tetraprenin mercury also gold in some cases related by the teenager pregnancy so which are rare cases but i think other than nephrology they are better to have this diagnosis on nephrotic syndrome in pregnancy more than in the pediatrics so now when we classify you now we do classification for uh, nephrotic syndromes we have now three classifications so we can classify according to the age as in that one we already discussed up for the previous slide where you have now the age of presentations so this than three months is congenital nephrotic syndrome infantile nephrotic syndrome between three months and one year and the childhood nephrotic syndrome between one year and 12 years so also you can classify nephrotic syndromes according to the response on, on the treatment so in that scenario you can have so the sensitive so the dependent the loss and the steady resistance the one we discussed for the, the definitions also you can find so in other classification according to the histology in we can have minimal change of disease focal segment of sclerosis membranous the mesangial proliferatives in um, mesangial proliferative nephrotic syndromes when you look about now the what they get about for the pre prevalence of the nephrotic syndromes when they look about now the histology you found the the majority has minimal change disease which is usually responding on the steroid so we have in other portions of focal segment of glomerulonephritis and the membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis and proliferative glomerulonephritis so in our setting most of our patients who have steroid resistance nephrotic syndromes they are suffering from focal segment of glomerulosclerosis so in other classification which is number 4 is you classify nephrotic syndrome according to the underlying diseases so you may have now idiopathy or you have a nephrotic syndrome secondary to systemic disease like lupus hiv hepatitis parvovirus malaria and cancers so how now a child with nephrotic syndrome what will it present so the presentation will depend on underlying disease and also it will depend on the severity especially for the albumin level which we increase now the edema so most of the children will present with edema edema usually start on the face uh, early morning but it may increase by times until now the child will have anazaka we have now peripheral edema ascites lower limb edema and for example scrotal edema and penile edema as you can see for these pictures So now when a child come and you are suspecting nephrotic syndromes how you make the diagnosis so the the first step is to proper history taking from the parent or the guardian uh, to know the durations and to exclude now the secondary causes or secondary diseases so you ask is of the hiv is sort of the toxin so sort of the malaria is this on them and the microbial malaria Uh, any drugs any swelling so you ask all the pan any history related by the patient the disease but also you support to school in our other conditions ask if there is any rash in the families so if there is alopecia in the families if there is any autoimmune disease in the family diabetics because those diseases sometimes can be associated with the nephrotic syndrome so you make now the diagnosis by lab investigations so you do deep stick or do your analysis and you can measure urine protein creatinine ratio once if you have the capacity in your lab or you can do major the 24 protein collections so most we use uh, in all the hospital and the facilities deep stick so when you measure deep stick you may find the children has the protein the proteinuria more than 3 plus and some children may have hematuria one or two plus so if the child has proteinuria has hematuria two plus not more than three plus we normal blood pressure without any abnormal the kidney function test so that's still have the 
a nephrotic range proteinuria not a gene. Because sometimes people they confuse a gene in nephrotic syndrome with the presence of hematuria. However, any child we present with the proteinuria, hematuria, hypertension, and the cell cast, usually you think about the uh, age genes or either nephritic, nephrotic syndrome associated. So, of course, you do liver function test to know the albumin levels. Uh, so, in this is zero, you know, the child has now the anazaka, you may need to correct. So, you do lipid profile because most of the children have the nephrotic syndromes. They have hyperlipidemia, secondary to lower albumin levels. You do complete blood count uh, to rule out if there is no any infection, something you can do PBF, to rule out the malignancy or throughout the malaria. So you do urea, electrolyte in the creatinine, to rule out the abnormality of the kidney function it is. Because once you have abnormality of the kidney function it is, you're starting now seeking for the unusual presentation of the nephrotic syndromes. So you screen for infections, you do urine in the blood culture. Uh, you do some imaging tests, especially can you be ultrasound to, know, to look about the anatomy, the position in the cells of the kidneys. You do chest X-ray throughout the tuberculosis. And if you have another test for confirmations of the TB, always do it, whatever you can have, a gene expert, a chest X-ray, mantle test, always do it at least throughout the TB before you start now the immunosuppression. You screen for secondary nephrotic syndrome, so and that one is supposed to be guided by your clinical history uh, and maybe your initial presentation. If you have the child with hematuria, proteinuria, and the child is not responding to your treatment, you support to do now those tests to do antinuclear antibody, P anchor and C anchor, complement three, complement four. You test for HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and the summertime. For some patient who support to do kidney biopsy. So, which patient now required to do kidney biopsy? Not every child to support to do biopsy for nephrotic syndrome. So, a, a typical presentations. So, any child who comes with heavy hematuria, especially microscopic hematuria, present with the hypertension and acute kidney injuries. So, that's why you support to do kidney biopsy as soon as possible because what we are dealing is different for the Minimal change in disease nephrotic syndromes. So, age below one year and above 12 years is better to do biopsy earlier because you may not deal with the minimal change in disease. Either it's genetic disease or either is secondary to another systemic infections. So, nephrotic syndrome associated with any systemic disease. When you have a child uh, maybe who has vasculitis, a child who has uh, HIV, hepatitis B, a child who you suspect lupus nephritis, malignancy, so you need to do a kidney biopsy to know so, so pathological finding classes, then to guide you for medications, and also to establish your prognosis and the earlier interventions. So also you do kidney biopsy for the patient who has steroid resistance nephrotic syndrome. So just remembering the patient who use the high dose per denisone, two milligram per kilo or 60 milligram per kilo per 60 milligram per meter square for the duration for four weeks and the patient is unable to achieve remissions. So for the, the doctor who do who requests the biopsy, because usually nephrologists can do the biopsy themselves, but you are not the one who are analyzing. Remember, it's, sample is be taken either by nephrologists or interventional radiologists, and you're supposed to send for analysis. So the, what you need to request, so you have now three methods of analysis. So in the how adequate size of bowel support to be. So you're supposed to have at least score between eight and 10. So that's for the, the good biopsy. Then when you request light microscopy, and immunostochemistry, that one are enough to, to make the diagnosis and the, to start the treatment. So like the microscopy, it is initial diagnosis evaluation based on morphological patterns of appearance of salt with periodic acid shift hemotoxins and eosine, the chrome and John liver stain. So that's the staining they use. So usually once you get the light in a microscopy, 
it's very easier to know and to assess the lesions of the kidneys, activities, and if the nephrotic syndrome is either uh, acute or chronic. So this test you support with this one in this the bowels. So another one you support request is immunostochemistry. So that will detect now immune reactant, IgAG, IgM, IgA, when especially you get now for the, especially for the lupus, CTDC4, C1T, fibrin A, K and the light chain. So, so kappa and the gamma. So those one will get it usually for the patient who has lupus nephritis and the nephrotic syndrome. So, but also other diseases you can discover, for example, IgA nephropathy, using this like microscopy. So in globally, it will detect now target antigens such as TL2A, a THDS7, DNG, B9, a deposition of protein like fibronectin, proteins, collagen 3, collagen 4, or other specific amyloid, amyloid species like LCT2 and fibronectins. So when you request now the electron microscopy, so that is with the fine locations extent and the characterizing of the immune or monoclonal depositions, extent of the photo process assessment and the structure globino basement alterations. So if the, the patient or the caregiver has enough money, it will be better to do all those tests. However, if the parent they don't have the money to analyze for those three components, so you need to request at least light microscopy and immunohistology. So now we come to discuss the approach on treatment. So for the treatment, you need the definitive treatment, also you need the supportive care. So, but in general, what you need for the treatment of nephrotic syndrome is the approach which will involve now the multidisciplinary teams, because you need the counselor, you need the nutritionist, you need the nephrologist, you may need also the, the lab to give you the drugs and the pharma, no lab to test and the pharmacy to give you the drugs. So you see it's multiple, but this thing I think is not only the doctor alone, it's just pharmacies, the artisans, the people for the lab, the counselor. So everyone will make his effort or high effort to contribute to the social welfare and the quality of the life for those children who have nephrotic syndrome. So if the child will come with massive edema, so in that time you will restrict now the, the fluid and the salt. But if the child has lower, lower blood pressure, you don't restrict the fluid. So you may reduce the fluid as now the normal, normal basic. So what you call the now insensible water loss. So use the now insensible water loss as the, the fluid that the child can take. So usually we calculate at the 400 means per meter square. So you can calculate and you say, you will take this amount, not above. But if the child came without massive edema, let the child take a fluid, normal diet. So what you recommend for the patient, not adding salt on the table, but not restrict the fluid, because we realize some children with nephrotic syndromes, because of the edema and the fluid restriction. And the, of course, plus the diuretic we are using, some children may develop now the acute kidney injuries. So for the one who has scrotal edema, you elevate the scrotums. So you may use a drug for the diuretic. It's better to combine it to diuretic. Uh, so that you can use a group of diuretic lasix, and you can use also now the potassium sparing. Uh, which is now the aridactone. So some patient may require maybe to give another strong drug, so like metoazone, or maybe you can use amylolite. So for the patient who have um, hypotension, say anazaka in the low albumin level, it's better to supplement albumin. Albumin is given, you can use the one gram per kilo per day. When you use albumin, 20%. So when you use 25%, so you can give 0 0.8 gram per kilo per day. For the one who use the means, if you use now a means, for 20% is five means per kilo, and the 25% you use now four means per kilo. So some children may use now anticotinic agent like S inhibitors and the ARBs, especially if we are using them for the children who has 
storage resistance nephrotic syndromes. For the children who, who are on a steroid, always vitamin D supplementation, the calcium supplementations has been crucial to help the strength, strengthening of the bone because those are children they are losing proteins, uh, binding, vitamin D protein, protein binding. Also, they have issue concerning the calcium or other one they are losing the thyroid binding protein. So they have hypothyroidism. Some of them may require levothyroxine to maintain the normal, the normal thyroid function, especially for the children who have a congenital nephrotic syndromes. So the protopump inhibitor uh, are used, especially when the child is in a higher dose of the, the steroid, the, at the two milligram, 1.5 milligram per kilo. I, but the dose less than one milligram per kilo, so you can try to evolve the protopump inhibitor because so they associate with the lower hypomagnesemia. So always give a prophylactic uh, antibiotic for any child with nephrotic syndrome who present with edema. So if the child has edema, you give a prophylactic antibiotic and the penicillin are the best choice for the, for the nephrotic syndromes uh, as prophylactic. However, if the child is resistant, is reacted or reacting on, on penicillin, you can still use the macrolide, you can get another antibiotic. So don't forget to do the culture of the blood, uh, of the ascites in the urine, you do the chest x ray for how this is kind of a sign of the infections. And any child who has any complaining of abdominal pain, always you suspect peritonitis and you support to be treating accordingly the guideline and the durations. So make the child to ampedate because it's reduced the risk of the having deep venous thrombosis. And you always you monitor your analysis daily, the weight daily, input output, and the blood pressure monitoring daily. So that's when you do in claim for the child is admitted in the in the acute cases. But if the child is stable, you can do deep stick once a per week. And once the child is attending the clinic, always we measure the weight, the height, the blood pressure in a renal clinic. So another supportive therapy is now immunizations. So the children with the nephrotic syndrome they have a higher risk to get now the infection, especially encapsulated bacteria. So those infections caused by pneumococcal, influenza, E. coli, they are more common for the children with nephrotic syndromes. So that's why you support to add additions of pneumococcal and the influenza vaccine. So I recommend to reduce the risk of infection for those children. However, if the child is in a higher dose of the, of the prednisolone, you don't give now this life vaccine because it will trigger severe infection. So you have help until now the child has a lower dose for less than one milligram per kilo per day. So life vaccine are contraindicated in children receiving corticosteroids or receiving sparing immunosuppressive agent. Because the sparing immunosuppressive agent we see in the, the following slide is the ADA crolambicy or either psychophosphamide. So if the child is receiving one of those drugs, you are not supposed to give now the vaccine. So another technique you can use to reduce the burden of infections is to immunize the health household contact with live vaccine to minimize the risk of infection. So if the child, you can vaccine maybe the other sibling to reduce the, the risk of infections. But however, if now the child is in you know, a higher dose steroid, always avoid the great exposure of the child to gastrointestinal, urinary, or respiratory secretion of vaccinated contact for three to six weeks after vaccination. Because they have shade of infections, the child may be contaminated by those, those issues. Following, uh, always be following close contact with the varicella infections, give a minimum non-immune children or immunosuppression agent of varicella zoster immunoglobin if available. If there is any family contact who has varicella infection or chicken pox, so vaccine now the, the, the family members at it reduce the burden of infection for the child who is receiving now the immunosuppression. 
So we come now for the, for the definitive therapy, which has two approaches. So one is to treat the underlying disease properly. So the second to treat nephrotic syndrome with steroid or other drugs. So if the child has, for example, now a HIV and the nephrotic syndrome, the best treatment is to suppress the viral load. So the adherence, compliance on the ERT is mandatory to increase the outcome of that child. So if the child has another disease, for example, the nephrotic syndrome and the diabetes, you need to control the sugar in the HB1C to reduce now the burden of the nephrotic syndromes. So now let's we talk about the use of the steroid for the children with nephrotic syndrome and the other immunosuppressive drugs. So I use the now Kedigo guideline, which is the gold standard for the nephrologist. So when we are looking about steroid sensitive nephrotic syndromes at initial episode, so if the child come for the first times and you make the diagnosis for the nephrotic syndromes, you will start with prednisolone with 60 milligram per meter square or two milligram per kilo per day, usually given as a single dose and it's preferably early morning. Not the two doses, not the dose at the end because it increases the risk factors of the bone mineral disorder and osteoporosis. So the maximum dose you can achieve is 60 milligram per day. So if the child has weight more than 30 kilos, you don't go more than 60 milligram once a per day. So the duration you can give four to six weeks. So some children will achieve the mission, initial for four weeks, but if the child is, is unable to achieve a, at least a complete remission, but has already achieved the partial remission, as you said initially, you can still give the chance for another two weeks. But if the child, you start on a prednisone higher dose and you still have proteinuria three plus or more after four weeks. So that one is classified as a steroid resistance nephrotic syndrome. You don't need to add another two weeks. Apart if the child, you did realize there's non-compliance, non-adherence, or maybe the child got another infections during the treatment. That one you can treat infections and we give another extra two weeks to see the response. So then once you finish, you came down, you give now 40 milligram per meter square, or use 1.5 milligram per kilo, maximum 40 milligram on 90 days. So this one you can give at least a for four weeks to six weeks. Then you continue the treatment between two and four months when you are tapering down the dose. So the recommendation for the, the child who have been responding on the first initial episode is at least for 20 weeks. That is minimum for, for three months. So your tapering down is supposed to complete the medication within at least three months on no, treatment. So when you have now a child who has now the infrequent relapse, so infrequent relapse you found is the child who has a one relapse within six months or more, but the child who has two relapse within 20 months. So usually we start with single daily doses. The child who has been responding on the treatment, maybe after two months, three months, then it has another relapse. So that child, once it comes, you start with single daily dose of prednisolone at 60 milligram per meter square, two milligram per kilo. The, the maximum not more than 60 milligram per day until the child has been in complete remission for at least for three days. So then after completing remission, you come down on prednisolone using a 40 milligram per meter square or 1.5 milligram per kilo per dose. So for at least for four weeks, if the child is now responding well, you can stop the, the, the treatment by taping it down slowly, slowly. So when you have now the patient who come, the frequent relapse, frequent relapse, you remember is the patient who have been now having the relapse more than two per six months, more than 14 per 20 months, by one year. So in that patient, you start daily prednisolone until the child has been in remission at least for three days. Then you follow the by training today of prednisolone at least for three months. Or training today is just to come for the 40 milligrams uh, per meter square, 1.5 milligram per kilos. So then prednisolone should be given on 20 days in the lowest dose to maintain remission without major adverse side effects in children. Frequently relapse, and steroid-dependent steroid 
sensitive nephrotic syndromes. Daily prednisone at risk dose should be able to be given to maintain the mission without major the effects. So if now the child can be responding, you still continue that prednisone at least maybe two to three months. So you can give an at least maybe a 10 milligram rotinic today, then taper down at the five milligram rotinic today, but the longer durations. So then daily prednisone support to be given during episodes of the upper respiratory tract infection and the other infection to reduce the risk of the relapse in each other, the frequent relapse and steroid dependent steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome already on alternate day prednisone. So let me repeat. So you have a child who have more than two relapse in six months or more than four relapse in one year. And the child maybe is a lower dose of 10 milligram once a per day or five milligram once a per day. At any time now, the child has coma or any sign of pneumonia or another sign of infections. In that duration, you come down, you come back at the day, higher dose of daily. So to reduce now the risk of day of the relapse until now infection is cleared. So what we do most of the time, our patient, they have our contact. So we communicate most of the time daily. And some of them, they can buy the deep stick. And once they have now a child who have a coma or other infections, they call, we tell them just to wait at the nearest hospital, uh, they measure your analysis, or either they measure themselves at home with deep stick, they send you the result on the WhatsApp. Uh, so then you tell them how much milligram per dimension they can take. And sometimes you get a good result. Once uh, you reduce now the cost of the, of the, the parent to come in Kenyatta, and the children usually continue the school without now interruption. So another treatment is when you have now if uh, we are still in the same treatment for the children who have frequent relapse and the side dependent nephrotic syndrome. So now the previous treatment is for the child who would respond with on those treatment. However, some children may have now adverse side effect. So the side effects of the prednisone are so many. So you can have now from the skin fungal infections, a stretch markers, a bone mineral disorder, they can have maybe skin changes, they can have a high blood pressure, high sugars, all those complications once they are there, you support to reduce now the dose of prednisone at the lowest, then you start the record now corticosteroid sparing agent. So the first choice will be now the activating agent where you use cyclophosphamide or use chlorambucil. For cyclophosphamide, you can use the orally or you can use IV. So when you use now oral, oral medications, you give now two milligrams per kilo per day for the duration between two and three months. But always you measure the cumulative dose you are not supposed to be more than 168 milligram per kilo. So always you measure how many milligrams you give for the child. At the time, now the child will come back in the clinic. You make now the sum, the sum of how many milligrams the child will be received, not to be given overdose. So some children say you may have a bit, because if you suspect maybe the child will not receive the medication, maybe the, the parent will not come back to get enough psychophosphamide. Or either once now the parent is starting asking the doctor, this drug we are giving, I follow the children who are receiving these drugs. So why are you giving these children of mine? The drug which is supposed to be given for the children who are suffering the cancer. So if now the parent is starting now, those patients, uh, despite your counseling, despite your explanations, so it's better for the benefit of interest for the child. You are admitted the child. You give now the dose once per month for three months or, or two months. So you calculate now you give the higher dose between 500 and 700 milligram per meter square, as long as you don't exceed the 168 milligram per kilo. So the child will be admitted once per month. You give a cyclophosphamide, a, you pre-hydrate the child, you give cyclophosphamide. The following day also you hydrate after cyclophosphamide, then you discharge. So they come back to get another dosage. So in some settings, so they use a chlorambicid, 
with my experience and experience in Kenyatta, we never use these drugs, but it's where they are used. So the dose is 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 milligram per kilo for two weeks. And the maximum cumulative dose support is not more than 11.2 milligram per kilo. So it is another alternative for cyclophosphamide, but for us, we choose the cyclophosphamide. I don't know if it's because the one we easier get and more available and probably more cheaper. So if the child is failed now to, to respond for this duration of the three months, you don't need to give another, another dose because of the risk of the complications and the risk of renal toxicities. So another alternative drug you can use for the children who have steroid dependent, who have side effect on the steroid, you can use these antihemetic drugs called the defamizol. The dose 2.5 milligram per kilo, we give an alternative days for at least for one year. And as if you will give now the short durations, most of the children we have now, they, they relapse. That's why you're supposed to give a day for the duration of 12 months. So, so you can use calcium inhibitors, EDA, cyclosporine, or tacrolimus. So the choice will be depend on the weight of the child. So tacrolimus is easier to manage because you can have a smaller tablet of 0 0.5 and the one milligrams. So cyclosporine is capsule. You can have capsule 25, 50 milligrams, and 100 milligrams. So depending on the weight, so you choose which one you give for the patient. So the KDGO guideline, they are recommended to start on cyclosporine because most of the studies show it has better outcome than tacrolimus. However, cyclosporine also has some side effects, especially for the gingival hyperplasia and some abnormal fascia. So you just always you check your side effect. If the side effect, you can interchange. So always you monitor CNI toxicities. So in Kenyatta, we can do what for the day, the cyclosporine or tacrolimus through drug levels in our renal lab to know if the level is not high. So usually we target the dose which is not more than 15. So we are still in the same treatment. See now this kind of steroid dependent is the made because it is difficult to treat and you may need to use different drugs and one patient can respond for one, another one cannot respond for another one. So there is another alternative if the child, maybe one you can use maybe one of those drugs, another one you can choose to give microphone thermophatics, you will start at 1200 milligram per meter square into divided the dose at the duration of the 12 months at least. So because you want to try to, to achieve your remission and to avoid the relapse. So when now we failed, we can use rituximab, which will be concerned in steroid, in children steroid dependent, nephrotic syndromes, who have continued the frequency relapse, despite the optimal combination of prednisolone and the corticosteroid sparing agent, and who have serious adverse effect on the therapy. So you can still use now the rituximab, uh, one thirty-five milligram per meter, per meter square, so it's available in the Kenyatta National Hospital. This is the drug, which is also very costly. Any child, the patient who have any child, it pays. But the one who don't have any child, it's difficult to assess that drug because they cost more than 100,000. So you try at least to maximize your previous drugs to achieve the remission. Few children who have been using it at Yaga Khan, and some of them will show the better, the better, the better outcome with rituximab. So the last cohort of steroid resistance nephrotic syndromes. Uh, so when you have now a child who is on a treatment, a steroid two milligram per kilo per day for four weeks, or sixty milligram per meter square for four weeks, you never achieve the any remission. Still have a protein more than three plus. So this patient will be benefit for the carcinary inhibitors. But in this condition, before you start, if there is a way you can do renal biopsy, will be recommended because it's one best indication for the renal biopsy when you have steroid resistance nephrotic syndrome. However, most of our patients they cannot afford, so it is difficult for the clinician 
my year wait the patient to get the money, which sometimes goes from 60,000 for biopsy, or my give the medications. If I found there's no response, I may introduce either MMF or I may introduce another drug. So you see, it is the balance. You look about now the economic status of the parent and what you, your goal as nephrologist or clinician and what you can help the child to survive to spare the kidneys and to continue the normal activities. So lack of the biopsy is not a contraindication to introduce the, the drugs. So CNI inhibitor should be maintained for a minimum for 12 months when at least a partial emission is achieved by six months. So it's meaning, so <clears throat> the duration of the treatment for the CNI most of the times is between 18 months and two years. So when the child achieved the partial emission within six months, partial emission is the child has no edema, and as I said, so the urinary urine protein creatine inhibition is less than 200 milligrams per, per grams. So in that time, you may continue because you found this response on CNI. However, if the patient is not responding on CNI, you don't have the partial emission within six months of the treatment, you discontinue the drug because there's no benefit. So for the children who has steroid resistance nephrotic syndrome, always you, you give a lower dose of corticosteroid therapy. So you, are, you give antiprotonic agent, S inhibitor, so you have a or you combine, which you combine with DEPS. So S inhibitors are better than ARBs because a lot of side effects associated with the ARBs in the children. So some children also can add now microphenotemophetyl or high dose corticosteroid or corticosteroid or combination of this agent to be considered in children who fail to achieve complete remission or partial remission with CNI and corticosteroid at 60 months of the treatment. So we give now my friend Mofeti, you come back with the steroid at 60 milligrams per kilo, then you see if you can achieve the, the remissions. So however, in these categories, Psychophosphamide is not recommended in children with steroid resistance nephrotic syndrome. So always use AC inhibitors, inhibitors uh, use now the steroid and calcium inhibitors. And if you fail, you can use now the MMF. So let's look about the complication of nephrotic syndrome. So the complication of nephrotic syndrome are so many, but the most common is infections. The most common infection is pneumonia, the bacteremia, or sepsis, peritonitis, and the cellulitis. So the reason is because the children will lose now the comp the complement the complement levels in the urine. So the so the cellum IgA and the IgG are also lost in the urine. And also they have T cell dysfunction secondary to immunosuppressive therapies. You now look about the child IgA prednisolone, 60 milligrams once per day for four weeks. That's a higher dose. So some of the older children may have severe infections. The most common cause is acabocytic gram positive bacteria, streptococcus, hemophilus influenza, and you may have so E. coli. So endocrine conditions is usually the children have hypothyroidism, which is more predominant. Also, they may have lower vitamin D. So the reason is because they are losing now the vitamin D binding in, in the vitamin D binding in the urine and also the thyroid binding protein in the urine. So that's why they have the, the, those endocrine conditions. So usually you measure uh, the, level, the level of the thyroid function in case, and you measure vitamin D in the calcium. Once they are low, you supplement. And if necessary, you will discuss with endocrinologists to get an adequate dosage. So in other complications, like the kidney injuries, most of the children they have now prelino, AKIs, they, some of them they, uh, can have actually tibia necrosis, intentional nephritis, either secondary to the medication, especially when you're giving the calcineurin inhibitors and the AC, AC inhibitors or, uh, or ARBs. So some antibiotics, for example, aminoglycoside also may trigger the kidney injuries. So always you measure in the follow-up the subsequent uses once the child is on antibiotic and once the child is on those those carcinogenic inhibitors. So the one who have been attending our clinic, each visit the child will come at least with urinalysis and the EECs and polymogram. And if suspect infection, what is it do the urine culture and the blood cultures? Another infection is hyperlipidemia. So you have now like hysteronemia, VAD, VAD. So the pathology behind this because 
LDL receptor, you have a, the children have a LDL receptor deficiency in the peripheral tissues, lead to diminished catabolism of LDL cholesterol in the, in the, in the liver. Also, there is increased hepatic 3 hydroximetic glutaric coenzymes activity causes, which because a hepatic cholesterol synthesis. So this one is deficient. Also, they have also desetin cholesterol acetyl transference deficient from adrenal glows. And also this reduction of the extrahepatic uptake for cholesterol and the synthesis of the HDL cholesterol in, in the liver. So that's why now the liver will overtake us to replace the loss. That's why they have a hyper, hyperlipidemia. So another complication is a stroke. It's not the most common complication, but I think me personally, I saw almost four children who had a stroke. So the cause is either secondary to the disease, nephrotic syndrome, where the children with nephrotic syndrome, they have hyper, hyperglobabilities. So they have increased procoagulation factors, one, two, five, seven, eight, nine, and 13. Also, they may have decreased anticoagulation factors, antitrobin 3 and the protein S. And so they have diminished fibronetic activities where they have decreasing of plasminogens, increased lipoprotein A and the alpha antiplasmin. So they have also hyperlipidemia and the endothelial cell dysfunction. Those are the leading for the stroke in the children with the nephrotic syndromes. However, the prediction of the stroke if you don't have, because those tests will be unable to do them, because those one in the textbook, not, but not practical on the ground. What you need to know, any child who has nephrotic syndromes and they have a lower albumin levels, has a higher risk to get severe infections and to get the stroke. So that's why you need to have treatment for the albumin at least to elevate at least at the normal levels. So in other general risk factors, it's just, Intravascular volume depletion because of the reduction of the oncotic pressure. Also, this presence with a little bit thrombophilia for some patient and indwelling catheter when you have now the canna for medication and presence for them and phospholipid antibody for some children so as in and phospholipid antibody syndromes. So, I, there is now this study done in, in Chinese. Okay, so, they look about uh, 1,995 children, and they found you know, 27 of them had thrombosis. And the thrombosis most occurred in the male of school age during the active stage of nephrotic syndromes. Also, when they did the biopsy, some of them, they found the you know, thrombosis and the primary embolism similar to society and geograms were the most common type of the thrombosis. So in most patients with the thrombosis, the symptom improved completely without complication when standard anticoagulation therapy was initiated. Usually, we give the lower dose of the heparin, and it's better to consult the hematologist to have the standard treatment. So in this study, 22.2% had a severe complication or square, requiring advancing, advanced diagnosis, modality, in the aggressive treatment. But you look about now, the patient was not so many. It is just uh, 27 within 1,995. However, uh, any life matter. So even if it is one over 100,000, we need to prevent and we need to treat. So another complication is respiratory distress, usually secondary to ascites, either infection like pneumonia, pleural effusion, pulmonary edema, and pulmonary embolism. Some care cases can have into solutions, and some children we have now the chronic nephrotic syndrome that decays steroid dependent, steroid resistance, and that one they evaluate for the chronic kidney disease. And some children they will die either because of infections or either they die because of the chronic kidney disease in the end stage of renal disease. So I go to so another study done in German where. They study for 345 children. They look about the complications. So they look about for the children who has focal segment of glomerulosis and who don't have focal segment of glomerulosis. When you look about now the complication, you may found lower respiratory tract infections was present 
in 22 trillions. So the total 22 trillion among 345. And when you look about upper respiratory infections, there are white waves, which is meaning the pneumonia it come as among the basic complications for the nephrotic syndromes. So another complication you look about is acute renal injuries, where you have now in children who develop acute kidney injuries. And when you look about so now hypertension, 34 over 345 so developed hypertension. And hypertension, as I say, we found now 17. So just is the data done in Germany. But even for us, you know, we found the similar result, but the infection is more common in our setting than other abnormalities. Hypertension is not more common for in our children. Apart from the children, they have maybe secondary hypertension or nephrotic syndrome associated with the systemic disease. So what is our take home message today? The nephrotic syndrome is more common in glomerular renal disease in children. They always take a good history to exclude the other underlying disease. Family counseling on adherence, compliance, and complication of the nephrotic syndrome, plus nutritional support is a mandatory for the children with nephrotic syndrome. So the role of the phone contact between the, the doctors, the nurses and the patient has improved the, the outcome care of the children with nephrotic syndromes because we are able to detect earlier complication, advise the patient. If and now with the use of the WhatsApp, sometimes the mother can give you the pictures you are device if you need now to be to the child need to be admitted or if the child needs to get the treatment as home basis. So always you screen for infection, especially tuberculosis and the malignancy before we initiate now the higher dose of the prednisolone. Adequate dose of the duration of the treatment are crucial to achieve the missions and avoid the side effects. So what we get the most of the time for the patient you are receiving in the Kenyatta, especially for steroid dependent steroid disease and nephrotic syndromes, you found the child was starting on the right dose. After two weeks, they drop down. So within one month, the child has already completed now the, the treatments of the, of the nephrotic syndromes. So when they have another relapse, they treat again. So you may find some children have been treated more than two years. So with short duration, when you get now the child, either you have the child steroid dependent or steroid resistance nephrotic syndrome. So always the fact to nephrologists or children with steroid resistance, relapsing nephrotic syndrome, steroid dependent nephrotic syndromes, any children who present a typical presentation, the one who has hypertension, a, the child who has a microscopic hematuria, so the child who has acute kidney injury, just refer immediately to nephrologists because you may deal with the, another pathology which is different for the minimal change of disease, which is responding to steroid. So nephrotic syndrome has a good outcome. So 60% of the children may recover for the first treatment. You may get a certain patient who will have now the relapse, and maybe 15% will get now steroid, day, steroid resistant, steroid dependent. 50% of the children who have steroid resistance, they will improve on carcinogen inhibitors and the 50% of the children will end up for the chronic kidney disease. So thank you for your times. Now it is the time for the comment, additions, and also the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sylvia, for a very informative and interesting presentation. Um, I think we will start with a question. Uh, how do we avoid pushing on teachers with steroids and infants? Okay, so the how you avoid now pushing features is it to give the right dose at the right times. Because what we realize, if the child is receiving now the normal dose of prednisolone for four weeks, then if there is a response to taper down, it's unlikely to have the pushing pictures. However, 
for those children who have no frequent relapse or steroid dependent, they have had to develop now the, the cushioning features. What we do, we give now steroid steroid sparing drugs. So we initiate either IMMF, psychophosphamide, or carcinoid inhibitors to avoid that complications. The next question is from Anruza. What are the systemic diseases related to necrotic syndrome? What is the systemic? Systemic, systemic diseases related to necrotic syndrome. Okay, so there are so many. The systemic diseases related to the nephrotic syndromes, especially in the children, not in the adult. So let's start for the malignants. You can have a codic lymphoma, but in adult also multiple myeloma is the one because there's pregnancy in a teenager, even in adult, it's in other systemic. So there's diabetes, there's malaria, there's lupus, there's HIV, there's hepatitis B and C, there is now parvovirus. So those are the most common cause. Also, the other one I noted, typical nephrotic syndrome, when you say, the, for example, the vasculitis, because those ones become another entity called the rapid progressive abdominal nephritis, which come for the AKI and nephrotic picture. So this one is not for nephrotic syndrome in pure. I feel those are the most common. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from Karen. Why do we measure the past morning during protein creatine in ratio and not one acquired during the day? Okay, so that is because of my experience. What do we get? Because you see, something can get to a high proteinuria. Then for the children and even for others, you see, when you are waiting now, the times. So the child didn't need to go to school, not even for the experience, not even for the for the, the purpose to get the right, right the specimen, but to see look about how the child will perform their activities. So those pictures should come in, but the best specimen is a morning for two so several reasons. One is to get now the adequate proteinuria, which not associated by the any other condition like activities, like the sotic proteinuria, or you try also to get the infection because in the deep stage which done earlier morning, so we show if there is infection or not. So that's the gold standard for the for the urinalysis morning. Uh, thank you for that. Um, just maybe you can repeat for the corticosteroid sparing therapy, which one is the first line for the steroid resistance? Okay, for, for the first line for steroid resistance, use carcinoid inhibitors. Either you can choose cyclosporine or tacrolimus. When you use a cyclosporine, it's between, those, between three to five milligrams, which is supposed to be divided into two doses. And what you look about, you look about in the weight of the child in the availability of the drug. As I said, we have the capsule of 25, 50, and 100 milligrams. If you have, for example, a child of less than, let's just say you have a child of 10 kilos. So if you use the maximum, you will have five milligrams, no, which will be 100 milligrams. In that time, you can use a, no, I'm sorry, that will give you 50 milligrams. So in that time, you can use 25 milligrams BD. But however, a child who have maybe 10 kilos, the child who is less than, than two years, so, or two years, you can't give now that capsule. In that scenario, you have the right drugs, the right dosage, but the way you give now the drug will be directed by the, between the capsule and the tablet. So in this scenario, you will use tacrolimus, which is 0 0.1 milligram per kilo uh, in the two divided dose. So which means 0 0.0.5 milligram per kilo per dose BD. So which it is a tablet and it's a small tablet. So in that scenario, you can use either psychosporin tacrolimus depending on the age of the child and availability in the course of the treatment. Uh, the next question is from an anonymous attendee. Um, excellent mm -hmm. presentation, Dr. Siriak. In our setup, do we routinely screen children for TB and malignancy before initiating steroids? That one we know is. So before initiating for, for malignancy, usually you see the child will do 40 more grams. And if your clinical history found in the child has fever, having a 
So you request PBA for at the same time on a marrow before you initiate the drugs. For tuberculosis, uh, usually use the chest X-ray to know if there's no active TB in the lungs. So, but if you have now maybe extra primary TB, also the clinician need to do the test, either mantle test or gene expert. So you don't start through the report today, screening for tuberculosis, so as we screen. Uh, thank you for that. Can one use other steroids other than prednisone? Yes. So you have either prednisone or prednisone. They are equivalent. Is prednisone and prednisone, they are the same. So you can use either prednisone or prednisone or whatever you can get. So there's no other one we use. So uh, because you still have the dexamethasone, you have metaprednisone, of course, but the dexamethasone is very strong and it has a lot of side effects. So including high blood pressure, severe headache, severe immunosuppression, you can use the dexamethasone. So metaprednisone usually is reserved when you need to pulse for the children was anazaka, because you may think maybe oral prednisone will not be absorbed adequately because of the gut edema. So that's when you use metaprednisone. However, if you don't have metaprednisone, you can use also dexamethasone for parisation for three days only, not more than three days. The next question is from Steven. Nephrotic syndrome in type 1 diabetes, how do we approach such bearing in mind pre existing autonomic factor? So, as I said, if the child has any underlying conditions, the best way to control that drugs, no, I'm sorry, that disease, is to control underlying condition first. So, it is a dilemma for the child who had the nephrotic syndrome and the, the diabetic. So, I think you have the one in child, uh, a child of six years who is diabetic and had the nephrotic syndrome. So there's two ways. You may increase now the dose of the either insulin because the steroid will increase the random, the, the, uh, random blood sugar, of course. If the child is responding on the steroid, so you may increase now the insulin levels for the treatment until now the child achieves remission when you're starting taping down. So if the child you start now on prednisone and you find the sugar control is difficult. You can use another drugs. So that's why you can use either tacrolimus or cyclosporin because it's not easier to, to control the sugar when you are giving a higher dose of the prednisone. And the another side effect of the highest prednisone, the children will increase now the appetite. So once the child now is having now steroid increasing the appetite. So your random blood sugar will be difficult to control. So that is another use for in the beta, not than the prednisone. So always you balance, you have the patient, you discuss with the parent, you discuss also even because you are not even the one doctor treating. So then you try to get the best option for the, for the patient, which is efficient and not costly for the, for the child. Uh, the next question is from George. How does one interpret the protein creatinine ratio? So it's the qualitative and the quantitative method. So you don't need the, it's the machine. The machine will measure uh, now the urine and you measure the protein in the creatinine ratio. What you need to use, so you have now the, the, the protein in the urine. And so you have the creatinine in the urine. What they do is the, is the now is, is the portions. The protein will be above, the creatine will be low. So then you have you divide. If the ratio is above two, you confirm now the nephrotic syndrome. It's very simple to get once you have now the, the lab result. Mm. But usually the lab they calculate it for you. But if the lab technician in the lab not they calculate it for you, you just you measure you have your proteins, you divide by your creatinine. So the ratio is above two, you confirm nephrotic syndrome. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Celia. I don't think we have any more. Oh, okay. So there's one more question from Esther Kini. Can nephrotic syndrome increase chances of renal cell carcinoma? No, there's another relationship. However, 
if the, the nephrotic syndrome is associated by the gene WT1, so within tumor suppressor, that patient has higher risk to get renal cell carcinoma. But if my experience, I never saw any child who developed the renal cell carcinoma because of the nephrotic syndromes. Sorry, I missed one question from Angela. Is there any value in performing urine protein electrophoresis in nephrotic syndrome to characterize the proteinuria? No, no. When you do it in electrophoresis, it, it, it does not give it for the for the characters of protein. It's just the quantitative method in the electrophoresis. Maybe what you're supposed to do, some patient can do the blood electrophoresis. If you suspect the child whole, Maybe you think the child has nephrotic syndrome and the child has sickle cell disease. Because also sickle cell disease can cause nephrotic syndromes, but there's no way for the urinary electrophoresis. Mm, for, for patients with hypoalbuminemia, how long should one give the albumin? So the standard we give for five days, the albumin is given once per day. In the what always we advocate for the for the children who are receiving the, the albumin is just to remember to give a Lasix. So either you can miss albumin with the Lasix, or either you can give a, a Lasix at mid infusion. So the dose, as I said, is one gram per kilo once per day. So or five minutes per kilo once per day for five days when you use the 20% albumin. But if you use now 25 albumin, 25% albumin, it would be 0.8 gram per kilo or four meals per kilo for the children. So albumin has a side effect to increase the high blood pressure because when you give one meal to the albumin, it will draw three meals from an interstitial compartment to intravascular compartment. So forgetting relaxes will cause catastrophic hypertension. So this you remember and you write to give the albumin with you. Uh, thank you for that, Syriac. Uh, I think we have answered uh, all the questions. I'd just like to say thank you again for that very, very interesting and informative presentation. I hope that we have taken home the key points and that we'll be able to better manage our patients with nephrotic syndrome, even in the peripheral facilities. Um, I think. Uh, Dr. Syria, I'll just let you finish off with a few um, take home points uh, for the clinicians, especially those who uh, are not in Kenyatta on how they should manage the nephrotic syndrome and uh, the referral system. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kailemia. So if the child is present in any facilities with edema uh, and, and when you do your test if the child has proteinuria, the child has hyperlipidemia. So after screening, you need to start the medications. So it's better to start now the drugs. So when you start with the drugs, you start with prednisolone at 2 milligram per kilo or 60 milligram per meter slayer. But it's better to use the weight because the most of the hospital they don't measure the weight of the child in the height at the same time. So you start at a milligram per kilo, do not over uh, 60 milligrams once per day. Then you monitor the progressions. You do weight, you, you monitor, you do now, you monitor the urinalysis, you look about now the daily the responses. If the child is not responding, because you may await at least one or two, two weeks to get a day, the response. So always you measure the blood pressure, you measure the urine, you measure the weight. So the partial emission is the child is supposed to reduce the weight. If the child is unable to reduce the weight and you still have edamasive hematuria or you have high blood pressure, it will be better to receive to refer that child where you know there is a nephrologist because what you are dealing with is different for minimal change of disease. So it is not difficult to, to deal with it, but you support to have now the good thing in terms of the nurses and in terms of the cancer to give a medication at the right times. So always remember to give the 
adequate dose and within the same moderation. Don't reduce the prednisone within two to three weeks. Even if the child can achieve remission within first week, you need to continue at higher dose until four weeks because that one, it increases now the emissions and it reduces the risk of the strain dependent on steroid resistance. So in that scenario, most of the children they improve. And if you find the child has features of the kidney injury on your admissions or high blood pressure at the admission, don't waste time define immediately where you know there's a nephrologist because you may deal with other conditions. Because some children will be lost in Kenyatta where you can have time to save them. Because the child came with, I want to give you one scenario. So there is a child who had nephrotic syndromes. I think that child come from, from Hidifi, here Kenyatta. So the child has severe, severe hypertension and there was no massive proteinuria uh, and there's no edema. But what the child presented, because it was on treatment for long times, the child had now the severe headache and no one who remembered to measure the blood pressure. So the blood pressure for the child who has five years was 195 over 156 millimeter of mercury. You can see how, how the complication for that blood pressure. The child became blind and they have been conversing. So even has now what's called the press where the child had the bleeding in the posterior part of the brain. So for the clinician, if you find the child has hypertension or massive hematurias, feature of the AKI, don't waste time. You refer to nephrologist because to deal with that child will be difficult. So the normal nephrotic syndrome in child who come between six years and 10 years, you can monitor. And if you have a problem, you can call, you can just help you to adjust the drugs in case maybe you have maybe relapse. So I think we can help so many children without referring to Kenyatta. Our phone is open always, you can consult. And we have the way to assist. And they have been assisting so many children from a different facility by one of our our doctors so always will respond, just call with assist. That's what I can tell you. And then we have a poor, poor prognosis for the steroid resistance. 50% they have now in the stage no disease, 50% they improve. So that's why we need to do screening for those who are not responding with the far area for the nephrologist. So I think we have we have now updating uh, always the renal disease because in the community, the people, they don't know much about the renal disease. Once or now the child is passing urine and the edema is subsided, some patient even they, they discontinue the drug. So you need now to have a good uh, counseling before you start the medications. And at the time you start the medications, you tell them with the complication expected and the some side effect, so then you release them at least say them, don't worry, this will happen, but we try to sort things out as long as your child today, we are normalizing the, the, the protein day and the urine. I think that's the message I can deliver to my colleagues. So let's work together as the team. Excellent, thank you, Syria. And thank you all for attending today's session. Um, yeah, I think we can close the session here.